<clears throat> All right. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to just pick up a few questions here, and uh, then we will go forward with our lesson. All right. Um, I have a list. Take up with this question from Isaac. Uh, Paul writing on the influence of sin. Was he presenting what happened to him or indicating what will happen to us if we are not in Christ? So, uh, Isaac, the answer is both. Um, in, uh, in Romans 7, Paul was describing his personal experience as a man under the law, without Christ, trying to live a good life. He wanted to live a good life, but the problem was sin was controlling him in his flesh. So that was true for Paul. And that is also true for every other person without Christ. It's the same problem the every person faces. That is, they may want to do good, and they may want to live you know, do good things, but there is sin working in the flesh. So what is the answer? The answer is, thank God through Jesus Christ. What happened? When you're in Christ, the power of sin over your life is broken, Romans chapter 6, and you have the spirit of life who sets you free from the law of sin and death, Romans 8. And that's where, um, you know, we are as believers. Is that okay, Isaac? Um, oh dear, Isaac is not here. Okay, all right, maybe he dropped off the call. Anyway, so that's the response for Isaac and maybe he can listen to the recording. Okay, so um, Shani, you have a question? Please? Yes, so it says, um, what is it? When you're saying death, like in Romans 8, when in Romans 8, 2, the law of sin and death. So does death also mean sickness? And then also, too, for Romans 8, 10, 11, I, quite, I was always having a hard time kind of understanding this. It says, if the spirit of him who raised up Christ Jesus, are they talking about God raising him up? That's what I'm kind of confused about. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your first part of your question, Romans 8, versus the law of sin and death, does it include sickness? Yes. Because sin, sin producing death. So sin causes all kinds of things in our bodies, including sickness. And, uh, you know, uh, and I, I, I remember, I, I may have shared this testimony, I don't know in which class, but uh, during the COVID time, and this was uh, not this, not this calendar year, but the last one, which was 2020, the latter part of 2020, uh, you know, one of our people uh, in church, and I, he's a close, I mean, in Norm, well, uh, he got COVID and he was in the hospital. Um, now, initially, he was at home just monitoring, then things just became very, very bad. He was in the hospital. And um, uh, things kept getting worse, and uh, you know. Uh, but during those days, uh, of course, um, uh, he had his phone with him, so I could record messages, short, short messages, send it across, you know, on WhatsApp, send it to him. He would listen. But one of the scriptures that we really took a hold of was Romans eight, and verse eleven. You know that. The spirit who dwells in you, the God by his spirit who dwells in you, will give life to your mortal body. So he took a hold of it. And of course, from here, you know, while I was sending him messages, we prayed together like that. He took a hold of it, that God by his spirit is giving life to my body. And, you know, the doctors every day were saying, okay, your lungs are affected. This lung is affected, and you know they're doing all the. The doctors are doing everything. And thank God for what the doctors are doing. We're not against that, you know. But uh, this was getting close to death, you know. And uh, but he was saying, hold, hold of the word of God. 
that God gives a life to every cell in my body. And, uh, you know, he eventually came out. And uh, when he went back, you know, after he got discharged, he went back a week like the doctor said, you are a walking miracle. And his, you know, his lungs are all cleared up and so on. But uh, just to answer your question, Shani, yes. Now we can, uh, Romans 8, 10 and 11, we can take a hold of that, that word saying, God is giving life to my mortal body. Even now when I pray for myself and I pray for people, that's what, you know, one of the things we believe God when we're when believing God for healing. God gives life to your body by his spirit who's living in you, right? So uh, that's, that's what we uh, affirm. The law of the spirit of life gives life to our mortal body. The second part of your question, Romans 8, 11, yeah. So it's talking about God who raised Jesus from the dead, the God, the Father. So God, the Son, Jesus was dead, God the Father physically, and God the Father raised him up from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is dwelling in you and me, and he's giving life to our physical bodies, is what Romans 8, 11 says. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Um, Isaac, uh, we answered your question a little earlier, but I'll just repeat it. You had asked the question, uh, you know, about was Paul writing about just himself, or uh, will it is it for everyone who's not in Christ? And so we answered and said that it's for both, right? Uh, in Romans seven, Paul was writing about his personal experience, but that is true for everybody who is without Christ. That uh, you know, we all want to do good, but we don't have the power to do it uh, because of sin that controls us, uh, and that's true for everybody. But the answer is in. Uh, in Christ, okay? All right, any other questions? Okay, go ahead, Divya. Thank you, Buster. Uh, so my question is related to what Shani uh, was asking. So I had understood um, uh, like uh, the law of sin and death and their death refers to the spiritual death, uh, the separation from God. Uh, so, uh, but when we come to the other references, what I understood was it is also talking about physical. Uh, so am I right or <clears throat> are they different? The death that uh, in Romans 8, 1 and 2, the law of sin and death. And in verse 8, 10 to 11, it says about giving life to your mortal bodies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, it's just confusing. Um, okay. All right. So just so to 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 you know to correctly understand it we go back to romans 5 where by one man sin came into this world and death through sin and death passed on all for all have sinned so starting from sin all the way to death which is both physical death and a spiritual death okay so everything from starting with sin death is both physical death and spiritual death. So what, had, what happened to Adam when he sinned? He died both physically and spiritually, right? So one man sinned, death came in. What was that? Both physical death and spiritual death. Because before sin, neither of these affected the human race, right? So if you go back to the um, what we refer to as, you know, the point of first mention, when it first mentioned, what, what did it mean? Romans 5, it means both physical and spiritual death. So that passed on all. So everything from sin all the way to death, which is spirit, physical and spiritual, came in. So that is continuing now here. And uh, what we mentioned was in Romans 7, what we said is, when Paul says sin is working in me and it produces death, in my members, in my body, that is physical, right? Um, uh, Romans 8, Romans 7, 13, uh, Romans 7, 24. Who will deliver me from this body of death or this death is working and uh, sin is producing death in me? He's referring to the con sin is affecting him. Of course, it's affecting his spiritual, uh, spiritual life, but it's also affecting his physical body. So death here, 
in Romans 5, 6, 7, 8, is understood as both physical and spiritual. It's inclusive. And so when we come to Romans 8, he's telling us that the Holy Spirit sets us free from the law of sin that controls us and death. So that's both physical and spiritual. In Romans 11, 8, 11, he's very specifically talking about physical because he's talking about the body. He says, look, God will give life to your mortal body by his spirit. So Romans 8, 11 is specific about the physical body. But otherwise, it's both spiritual and physical. Okay, now it's clear. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, um, see another question. Can the sin of a father, mother affect the entire family? If yes, how does one overcome this? Can the sin of a father, mother affect the entire family? How does... Uh, one overcome this. Now, I, I, the, the reason I'm pausing is because uh, it's like a yes and a no. The the no is if you are a believer, then you don't have to. You know, let's say if the parent sins, sin, commit sin, and if a son or the the son or daughter is a believer, they don't have to be subject to that. Because uh, you know you are in Christ. Let's say the, the parent is doing something wrong. It doesn't have to pass on to you. You stay, you make the choice to be free from it. Uh, the yes side is, Uh, there are consequences to sin. And uh, if the parent opens the door to something, but the child, the son or daughter, doesn't know how to stand under, you know, as a believer, stand under the protection, then yes, it does. It does affect, it will affect, you know, both in the natural and, of course, in the spiritual. But as a believer, you and I say, I'm not going to be affected by it. We have the right to do that. Right? The, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ redeems us from everything, and we're not subject to it. But if a person does not know how to stand in their place in Christ, then the influence comes. Right? So this, this, this effect of sin couldn't, be both in terms of behavior and also in terms of the effect, the consequence. So in terms of behavior, for example, you know, let's say the father was somebody who was an ill-tempered person. If the son or daughter is a believer, then the believer just says, look, I refuse that. It's not going to control me. And they can be free from it. They don't have to be subject to that same ill temper that the parent had the son or daughter can walk free because in christ you are free but if the son or daughter does not know that they're going to just imbibe the same thing they will follow the same behavior and therefore they will come on sub in subjection to that same spirit of temper anger right so that's how, you know, uh, so that's why I'm saying it's yes and a no thing, because it is no if you know how to stand in, if a believer knows how to stand in his authority in Christ. But if the person doesn't stand in it, then they're just going to come under the influence of whatever that is. Right? And uh, be subject to it. But we don't have to be. We don't have to come under that. I hope I answered your question, Nicholson. Do you have a follow-up question to it, or is it clear? Uh, yes, that's clear. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Shana, your question? 
Yeah, it was just kind of a reference to Nicholson's question. I understood what you said, but what about if um, the son or daughter is a child? Like they can't really, you know, I, I know you were saying that like they know who they are in Christ and they're not subjected to it, but what if they are minors? So mm -hmm. is there exception to the rule? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a... Uh... Now, I cannot give any chapter and verse on this, but I can just give some observation. In some parts where, you know, we've gone to minister, what I've observed, now, I'm not, this is not chapter and verse, so, uh, you know, please, I'm not giving you a biblical answer, I'm just giving you an experiential answer, so it could be open to debate. What I've seen, and especially we went to one part of uh, one part of uh, uh, India. It's in a, it's in a, in a western state of Maharashtra, and we were preaching in a certain area. And the worship started. Okay, so we were having an open air meeting. The worship started, and we saw children, children, you know. Um, I would say like, you know, like five years, six years, some of them are 10, you know, kids, literally kids, possessed, demon possessed. And they started, you know, they were dancing to the music. I mean, they were like, you know, I, I wouldn't call it dancing, but so the worship on the stage started and we are worshiping Jesus. This is an open air crusade meeting. Worship started. And here these kids come forward. And there's like, it's number of them, not one or two. It's like many of them. And some adults also. And they started swaying and doing this. And it was not the Holy Spirit. It was demonic. They were, uh, so that the spirits in them began to, you know, uh, react to the worship and the preaching that came on later. The sisters began to react. And these were kids. They were not. And of course, you know, this was an area where there was a lot of uh, different kinds of worship happening. So I, I always remember that. Because it was so many. You know, suddenly, so the crowd was there in front of the stage, out on the field, you know, ready to, and they just all assembled. The moment the worship started, the reaction just happened. Like it just did all, a lot of people, kids and even some adults started, you know, manifesting like this. I was wondering, these are kids. Like, you know, little ones, you know, probably some, many of them less than 10, 11, 12. And they are possessed. Uh, we understand the spiritual side. Uh, because we know the area where we were, we know, you know, what was all going around and what was happening spiritually in the village area. But these their lives were affected. So uh, I'm not giving a Bible answer, I'm just giving a you know what I actually saw that uh, the kids were affected spiritually. And in this case, they were affected spiritually in a wrong way because of, you know, what must have been happening in their home or homes or so on. So that's one thing. Now, biblically, the positive is there. So if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, so this is on the positive side. It says that, I'll just give you the reference, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It says that uh, uh, verse 14, 1 Corinthians 7, 14, it says that, um, again, this is talking about the family. It's talking about the unbelieving spouse and the children are sanctified to God because of one 
spouse was a believer. Okay, First Corinthians 7 verse 14. So if there's even one family member, husband or wife, who's a believer, then the unbelieving spouse and the children are sanctified to God because of the one who's a believer. So this is the positive side. But what I had observed was the negative side. And it's very sad. And I was thinking, how are we going to set these kids free? We can't because even if we do anything, they're all on in sub, you know, they'll go back home. And if the parents don't change, it's just going to get worse, you know. It's just it was a very, very sad thing to see. Okay, thank you. And just and just a question. I know that um, I think somebody asked this a couple of weeks ago in terms of you saying they're demon possessed. If somebody um, the demons cast out of them, isn't it true that if they get baptized with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues that that this demon can't go back in them? Is that true? Uh, that's very important. You know, so if a person uh, is delivered, it's very important for us to strengthen that person in Jesus Christ. Uh, as quickly as possible uh, so that they can be protected. Uh, so the way Jesus painted the picture, of course, from Matthew 12 was like he talked about a house, uh, you know, so when the evil spirit or spirits are evicted, the house is all cleaned up, but if it's empty, then they're going to come back. They will come back with seven more of their uh, spirits. So what's, what must we do? We need to fill up the house with God himself. So we need to get that person, you know, give give their life to Christ, uh, get them filled with the Holy Spirit, and get them established in, you know, in a, in in God's Word and a, in a good Christian environment, a good Christian fellowship, so that, you know, those the spirits may try to come back, but they say no. This house is occupied by God; cannot go in. Okay. Thank you. Nicholson, yeah. Oh, I, I, the questions are coming. I was <laughs> going to go back. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Pastor. Last. No problem. Time. No problem. Uh, just since you touched on First Corinthians seven fourteen, someone asked me this question and I didn't really know what to say. Uh, they were talking about uh, children now, like uh, Shani was talking. If they are minors, then is does that verse talk about salvation? Or what does it talk about now? Minors don't really know if they're really saved. So does your parents' salvation depend? I mean, does is it like a ticket for you also to be mm -hmm. saved? Or if they're really small, they're not saved? On the flip side, is it like if they're unbelievers, if the parents are unbelievers and the children are just innocent, will they still be saved or will they not be saved? And mm -hmm. I, I did not know what to say to that. So I'd like to... So, oh, yeah. So. yeah, so First Corinthians 7, 14 talks about the children being sanctified. That means they are set apart. They're, 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 they're holy in the eyes of God. So it's not like they are saved, uh, but it's talking about them you know, being set apart. God looks at them in a special way. They are hallowed. They are holy before God. They're sanctified, both the spouse, the unbelieving spouse, and the children. So they come under that blessing. Uh, uh, um, that is that sets them apart before God. So God will deal with them specially. Of course, they you know when they grow up, uh, they have to make their uh, choice to follow Christ. So to answer the other question is, what about children, right? Uh, so uh, if a child dies, uh, where will the child go? Where is the child automatically saved? The Bible doesn't specifically state it, but we can infer, right? There are two passages we can quickly go to. One is back in Romans 7, <laughs> uh, which we did, uh, you know, we went through. Uh, uh, Romans 7 verse 9. Uh, Romans 7 verse 9. Paul talks about his own life. He says, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So uh, it's very interesting. 
Paul is saying, I was alive, but when I came to know the law, I died. Now remember, what is Paul's life? He was raised up Jewish. He was raised up in the tradition of you know, the uh, Judaism. So he's saying, I was alive, but when I got to know the law, I died. And then his life continues. He, he continues on to coming to know Christ, which is Romans chapter 8. So he's talking about the stage of his life when he was alive before the law. So Romans 7 verse 9 is a very interesting verse. Uh, you know, And one of the understanding, which I, I, I feel is correct, is that as a child, like till he didn't understand the law, that is, okay, this is right, this is wrong, whatever that age, you know. So we, we just refer to it as the age of accountability. You know, what exactly that age is, whether it's 10 or 12, or I, I don't know. But it's that some age when the child is in that stage where alive without the law, but because you're not accountable yet, but when the commandment came and the understanding of the commandment came, you realize you're actually dead. So that's one reference. The other reference is in Matthew 18, I think, where um, Jesus himself mentions about the little children and he says, um, um, uh, uh, you know, Matthew 18, one to six, he talks about the children. He says, don't let them, forbid them not. And uh, he says, don't offend even one of them. And uh, he talks about uh, verse 10, Matthew 18, 10. He says, I say to you that in heaven, the angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven. So he's talking about children, physical. You know, so there were little children that are coming. He says, don't stop them. And verse 10, he says, the angels are seeing the face of my father. So there's something special about the children here. He's not talking that they will get saved, but we can infer, like both from Romans 7 and uh, uh, here in Matthew 18, we can infer that um, up until this age of accountability, you know, uh, these children are innocent and God will take them. So I, I cannot give a chapter and verse answer, but I can only say, you know, we can infer which means that I could be wrong. Uh, uh, I'm just saying that based on, you know, Romans 7, 9 and Matthew 18, 10, if you ask me, my opinion would, you know, would be that, yes, you know, when children die before this time, when they come to know the, the you know, the law, the, uh, what is what is required of them, uh, you know, God will take them to heaven, uh, is my understanding. Is that how? Thank you, Pastor. It really okay. does. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, there's another question here. Sid Kinner. There's a group of people who is dominated by the society, which is transgender. God created the man, woman, we know. But what about these community? Will they go to heaven? And there's a problem with both men and women in New Delhi, that being a social worker students. Uh, I have seen that a number of people He's born as a boy, but he's not happy from inside. He's, in, he's a girl, and girl thinks that from inside they're a man. And there are more than 8,647 cases like that. Okay. Okay, you've, uh, you've opened up a very, uh, you know, difficult subject. Uh, we will, in our second year, we have a course on apologetics. And we, in that course, we do address a lot of these social issues. Uh, how do we respond to it? But let me give you, you know, a very like a one minute, one minute answer to a very difficult subject that you have raised. First thing uh, is that God does not make any mistakes, right? That um, God has created male and female. Genesis chapter one, okay? God created the male, female. And God doesn't make any mistakes. 
second Romans chapter one, we see, you know, a lot of the issues happening where God gives them up to their own debased mind. And uh, they go about doing all kinds of things. So that's Romans one, Romans chapter one. So a lot of the things that we're seeing are the result of the work of a what Romans 1 says is a debased mind. This is not what God orig originally intended, right? So I'll just leave it at that, meaning God doesn't make mistakes. And there's a lot of things that we are doing out of our own, the corruption of our own minds. So can we help them? Of course we can help them. Should we love them? Of course we should love them. Should we relate to them? Yes, we relate to them because they're all people. They need to be loved. They need to be understood. They need to be helped. Do we, should we condemn them, judge them? No, we should love them. And our goal is to help them, first and foremost, come to that place that God didn't make a mistake in their lives. And uh, you know, when they have that understanding, then. Self-acceptance often flows out of the understanding of being accepted by God. When they understand that they have been accepted by God, then there is that un, you know willingness to accept the way they were born. Uh, you know, so it, it it is a very difficult area, uh, Sid Kino, and I've just given you a very one minute uh, response to it. But, you know, in our second year, we will talk more on it, uh, you know, and not only this, but other similar social issues. And what is the biblical response? How do we respond to people? But to keep it short, don't condemn them. Don't, okay, let's put it positive. We have to love them and bring them to a place where they know God has not made a mistake, God accepts them. From that will come the understanding for self-acceptance. Okay, and we have to love them, right? Okay, uh, and uh, I hope I, you know, I know we've, <laughs> we've, we've addressed a lot of different questions. Now we'll go back to uh, our lesson. And uh, Sitkina, we'll take this question up, you know, second year in detail. Okay. Okay, Pastor. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, let's go back to our. Yes. Okay. So we have come till far, this far. So basically, what we are saying is, or what we have said is, the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Right? So this is the key to walking in the provision God has made for victory over sin. So uh, we must walk according to the spirit of life. Okay, we must walk according to. When the Bible says according to, it means I submit to and align myself to the spirit of life. So if you and I submit ourselves and align ourselves to the Holy Spirit, his influence, then we will find that we will not walk according to the flesh, but we will be walking according to the spirit and we will be able to fulfill much more than the righteous requirement of the law. So what Paul is, and I'm going back to Romans 8, and what Paul is teaching us here in Romans 8 and in these initial verses is, you know, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That means whatever the law requires, and actually much more than what the law requires, we are able to fulfill when we walk according to the Spirit. So this is in contrast to everything he has said in Romans 7. 
In Romans 7, he said, hey, I want to do the law. I want to keep the law, but I can't do it because there is sin in my body. It's controlling me. Come to Romans 8. He says, hey, when we walk according to the spirit, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us or through us or by us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That means when you and I are walking in submission to and aligned to the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are doing much more than what the law requires of us. We are able to do that. Okay, Because when we are walking according to the spirit, uh, we are spiritually minded. We do not live according, uh, to, we do not set our minds on the things of the flesh, but we live according to spirit. We, we mind or we set our mind on the things of the spirit. Right? So, so the key now, right? How we can do much more than what the law requires when we walk according to the spirit. How do we do that? We must be in the spirit, right? Romans 8. Uh, I'm just going a little fast because I just want to try and finish this off, but I hope I'll get the, get the key points through to us. It says, Romans 8, same chapter, Romans 8, verse 9. He says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. You are in the spirit. So you're not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. You're not in the flesh, but you're in the spirit. That means I'm not living life in the flesh, gratifying the desires of the flesh, but I'm living life in the spirit, meaning under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So that's where life originates. As if for a believer, your life originates from the influence of the Holy Spirit. For a worldly person, a carnal person, life originates from the dictates of the flesh. It's outside in. For the believer, it's inside out. Right? You are in the Spirit. You're going to flow out of the influence of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So uh, a, a, a parallel passage to Romans 8 is Galatians 5, where he says, you know, uh, we must walk in the Spirit. We have to live in the Spirit. So that's being in the spirit. Walk means, you know, how you live your life, how you conduct yourself. You live, walk in the spirit, live in the spirit. They're synonymous terms. That means you are, your life is originating from the influence of the Holy Spirit. You're always in submission to him. And your life flows out of that. And when you and I are living life like that in the spirit, then we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Right? Um, to bring break it down further, Romans 8, 12 and 13, he says, Brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you by the Spirit put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. Now notice this part. By the Spirit. By the Spirit, put to death the deeds of your body. Okay. By the Spirit, put to death the deeds of your body. So I'm in the Spirit. Now the flesh may still cry out for doing wrong things. But because I'm in the Spirit, I put to death those deeds of the body. Simple example. Perhaps, you know, uh, a, 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 let's say a believer who let's before this person became a believer, he whenever this person became angry, they would become very violent. They will, you know, do all kinds of nasty things in their anger. Now they become a believer. They understand this truth of identification, and they learn to. Be in the spirit. That means walk yielded to, in submission to and aligned to the Holy Spirit. So will they get angry? Of course they'll get angry. We are still human. Our bodies, uh, you know, we, we, somebody says or does things, it irritates us. We do get angry. So 
will that person feel angry? Of course, they feel angry, feel agitated. But at that moment, what the person does is, Holy Spirit, I'm right now feeling very angry, but I'm submitting to your influence. Help me, Holy Spirit. And instead of reacting violently and doing all kinds of nasty things, the person's felt angry, but he has put to death the violent reactions because they are walking according to the Spirit. They yielded to the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit calms them down. Holy Spirit gives them peace. He's felt angry. He's felt agitated, of course. But that's in submission to the Holy But he comes under submission to the Holy Spirit. And that violent reaction and outburst of anger is put to death. So that's how we are able to overcome the things of the flesh. The temptations will be there, the invitations to do wrong will be there, but we are living according to the Spirit. We are living in the Spirit. We are living uh, uh, in submission to Him. We are walking by the Spirit. We are living in the Spirit. So what happens when we submit ourselves to Him? He helps us to put to death or bring an end to or eliminate the, the wrong things that we would do otherwise. And we are led by the Holy Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit. So led means, when you're led, means you follow. He goes first, you follow. He goes first, you follow. So you're led by the Spirit. He guides you, he directs you, he leads you. So, uh, uh, the, the Holy Spirit becomes our leader and we become followers. Before the flesh was the leader. Now, anything the flesh wanted to do? Yes, yes, yes. We do. No, no. I'm not the, my flesh is not leading. My flesh is not dictating. The Holy Spirit is my leader. I'm going to wait for the dictates of the Holy Spirit. What he says, I will follow. So that's another way to say here, you know, walking according to the Spirit. We are led by the Spirit of God. And we learn to listen to the witness of the Holy Spirit. You know, so the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. So listen to this. You know, sometimes when you and I don't know what's right and wrong, Holy Spirit, what should I do? Listen to the witness. If there's a sense of peace, then it's okay. If there's a you know, sense of, no, no, it's not, don't do it. Then don't do it. Why? Because you're listening to the witness of the Holy Spirit in your spirit. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. He lets us know, you know, we are children of God. He lets us know what is ours. He speaks to us. He communes with us in our spirit. So learn to listen to that, you know, to the Holy Spirit. And then it'll help you know what is right, what is wrong. Especially in matters where, you know, you may not have a chapter and verse for something, but listen to the Holy Spirit. He'll guide you and me into what is right. Okay. And part of this, uh, the last point is in Romans 8, 26, same chapter. Paul writes, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. The weaknesses he has already mentioned earlier, the weaknesses of our flesh. How does he help us? He says, we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but he makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So how does the Holy Spirit help us in our weakness? Many times we don't know what to pray. So God, what, what should I pray? I mean, take it, oh, how do I handle this? How do I pray in this situation? Well, the Holy Spirit makes intercession. When it says for us, it doesn't mean independent of us, but it means together with us. How do we know that? Because when you look at that word help in the Greek, it literally means the Holy Spirit takes a hold of together with us against our weaknesses. 
So that's the meaning of the word help. It doesn't mean he goes out and do it, does it on his own, but he takes a hold of together with us against our weakness. So therefore the context is already set here. How does he help us? He makes intercession along with us or through us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. That means that, you know, you're praying in the spirit and these are not things that can be expressed in articulate speech, but these are groanings. They are, uh, you know, expressions from the Holy Spirit. So that's praying in tongues. So you pray in tongues, you pray empowered by the spirit and he helps in our weaknesses. So when we don't know what to pray for, pray in the spirit. And that's a great way to just yield yourself to the Holy Spirit so that you can walk victorious over the flesh. Okay, so I somehow managed to finish <laughs> uh, this lesson, but I hope uh, you've got the, the main point here in lesson seven, which is, hey, the Holy Spirit is here to help us walk victorious over the flesh. And also in that process, he is releasing life to our bodies and we can walk in the life of God. And we have only a few more minutes left. Um, do anybody has any questions, any things you want to ask? Everyone's okay? Pastor, if you can, if you could explain, be in the spirit. What? Uh, uh, say, say that again, Rosalind. Which, what, what, what did you want? Um, to be in the spirit, Romans 8, now. Yeah. So to be in the spirit means we are, our life, the way we live life, starts off in the spirit in our submission to the Holy Spirit. So how do we know we are in the Spirit? I mean, uh, you know, so you can think about example, okay, this example. A fish in water. Right? So it's in the water. Its life is originating from the water, literally, right? The fish, the water goes into the kills or whatever and takes oxygen out of that water. But it's life, so it's in the water. Its source of life is from the water. So he says, "Be you are in the spirit, you're not in the flesh. That means my source of life is not from the dictates of my flesh, but my source of life is from the Holy Spirit. So you can imagine, you're, if you and I like the fish, the Holy Spirit is like the water. That's how we're supposed to live. We are deriving our life from him. And we are always, you know, wherever the fish swims, it's under the water. We're always under the, uh, the influence of the Holy Spirit. Our life is always originating from him. So you're always in the spirit. You're always the fish in the water. You're always covered. So our life begins when we are, we are submitted to him. So practically, it means I'm in submission to him. I am being led by him. And uh, I'm listening to the witness of the Holy Spirit. You know, if he, if I feel something is not, he tells me something's not right, then I obey that. And I also pray in the Spirit so that he helps me overcome the weakness of my flesh. Practically, that's how we do it. Is that okay, Rosalind? Does it help? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's close. Um, we have just a minute more. I'd like to request somebody to uh, please pray with all of us. Uh, let these truths sink into your heart and begin to practice them. Begin to live by these truths uh, and let it strengthen you uh, in your walk with God. All right, anyone could unmute your mic and please pray with all of us.
Okay, somebody, go ahead. Uh, let me pray. Father. Go ahead, Spacious. Heavenly Father, we want to bless your name this morning. We want to give you glory and honor for the moments that you have shared with us and encountered by this studies. That we pray that, Lord, continue to let the truth of our identity in Christ grip our hearts so that our lives will continue to be victorious over sin, over the world, and over evil in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that you continue to abide with us with your presence as we move into our next studies. Lord, continue to grant us wisdom, understanding of your word in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray you commit Pastor Ashes into your hands, O God. Lord, we pray that you continue to enlarge his understanding and insight of your word, that as we encounter him each day, he will share with us in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you for blessing us and letting us be a blessing unto the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being part of the class. Uh, have a good break. And enjoy your next class and the rest of your day. God bless. Bye now. Bye. Thank you, everyone.